We're back on our EPS happy hours with one of the shyest travelers I know. She's very nervous. She said she's very shy. It's going to be hard to get her to talk, but she's joined, willing to try a little bit. So the, the quiet and shy Denai Bustamante is with us tonight. <laughs> Hello, everybody. You see my smile? That's because I'm shy. <laughs> Thank you for having me here. <laughs> Talk about being so shy. We can see how shy you are and, and becoming an extrovert when you travel. Yes, yes. I, at the beginning, when I started traveling, it was a little bit difficult for me. But of course, traveling helped me to, to get a little, I don't know, more because you have to interact with the people, of course. But, you know, I, I'm not shy when I'm talking to a person directly. But when I know there are a lot of people watching at me, and I become, of course, more shy. And uh, I, I don't know, like a lot of people love that i teach salsa but i feel so bad when i have to teach because i know a lot of people there watching at me my moves and i have to explain everything so it's, it's a little bit difficult for me <laughs> <laughs> well you say you're you're not a choreographer but i i know one amazing story where you became a choreographer talk about carnival in nigeria oh yes well um I'm a good uh, dancer. I have a very good level, but I never learned. I, so all I know from dancing, I learned from the street and from myself. So I never went to school for, even in Cuba, we have a lot of dancers. And that's exactly why I never learned because my parents, they wanted me to go to the university and not to learn how to dance. But my level is, is very good. So when I travel, people always ask me to, to give some classes. So I, I wanted to go to a carnival in Nigeria. So I was planning my trip there and somebody told me about this carnival. I didn't know about it because there is not much uh, online about this. And um, I went there and I wanted to dance at the carnival. So I tried to contact some people. It took me a while until they answered to me. And I told them, OK, I want to dance with a traditional costume to learn some African moves and participate there. So when I arrived there, I was the only non-black person. <laughs> so they told me that I am white person. They they call me Oyibo, which is the, the word they used to say to white people. And they was like, oh, Oyibo is going to dance with us. So you are going to be our queen. I was like, what? And so they gave me all this costume and they make my hair so amazing, so beautiful. Oh, nice. And I was dancing there. There was like a long street and you dance the whole day. So you have to dance and walk along the street. And you have some points where there is like a jury uh, checking your moves and giving points to the to the dance school. Mm -hmm. And every time we stop in front of this jury, I had to take my shoes off because you have to dance like African do barefoot. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it was so hot and I was burning, but I had my smile all the time and trying to do my best moves. And after this, they were like, oh, actually, you learn it very fast. Would you like to do a choreography for us? I was like, oh my God. So they gave me 40 <laughs> girls and I had to create a choreography because then, I mean, this carnival is this, I think it's the longest carnival probably in the world because it's a whole month. It's from mm -hmm. the 1st December until the 31st. And they have different dances. They have a lot of different things. And one day they dance all the African uh, styles. And one day they dance like foreign styles. So there was a group dancing salsa, but I couldn't join because you have to dance with a dance partner and I didn't have any. And there was a group doing samba because I know how to dance samba. I danced in, in Brazil carnival before too. They asked me to do this choreography. So I got these 40 girls and I did my samba choreography. So I got to dance twice at the carnival in Nigeria. <laughs> wow. So, you know, we, we have many travelers. Uh, I have to say myself included, I, I fit in a Nigeria visit on a very short time of a few days. And I, uh, I, I feel like, I, I felt like I should have seen more. And now I really feel like I should have seen more. I just spent the whole month there, 10 days at the yeah. carnival and the rest visiting the country. And talk about the visiting the, the country. What other areas did you see? Uh, what, what do you recommend? Yeah, uh, I went to Abuja. That's where I started the trip uh, because mm -hmm. I got some contacts uh, from my salsa friends there. And I was invited to a wedding. It was also amazing because they had to do the dress for me. Everybody had to go with the same color. And it was a very nice experience. And I stayed a few days in Abuja, also dancing salsa. Then 10 days in Calabar. Then I went to Lagos, of course. And um, from there, I visited a um, few other cities very close to Lagos. And I went to, uh, there's a city called Ile Ife. And I went there because they have the Yoruba religion and we had a lot of influence from this religion in Cuba. So I wanted to see mm -hmm. some museums and some history about that. 
I didn't know at that time they also have a UNESCO place near to, to, to the city. I mean, near, it's like one hour driving from there, but on the, in the Osun state. So if you want to go to this um, a UNESCO site there, there, but it could be like four hours driving from Lagos. Uh, so I didn't go there, but I, I, I went to a few places near Lagos and the islands, of course. So it was very good. I spent New oh, Year's wow. Eve there too. Oh, wow. What, what, what is the New Year's Eve like there? Well, first they invited me because I I I got those I got those contacts from salsa. They invited me to a private party, but it was an expat party, and so everybody was from another country there. So we wait mm -hmm. there for for New Year's Eve, so twelve o'clock. And after this, we went to a club, and I just remember I entered the club and I saw the tables. And you know the Nigerians they like to show off. So in every table you have like ten bottles of champagne. And I was like, mm. my God, you have to show that you have a lot of money. And then at the end of the night, they probably drank like two or three bottles and they had to return the rest of the bottles. But they wanted to have it on the table to show everything. <laughs> also at the wedding, you know, like every, like you see in the movies, it's exactly like this. At the wedding, they are just throwing money, 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 money like this. And there are a few girls on the floor like collecting all this money. <laughs> so, so, wow. Yeah, that was, that was very good. <laughs> I'm, I'm getting a sense that my travel days which start fairly early and I'm busy all day and then after dinner I'm usually in the hotel working or going to bed. It sounds like that's just the beginning of what, what you're doing on your days. I, I'm missing out on a lot. <laughs> yeah, that's what I do. I go I like sightseeing the whole day, sometimes even hiking and I do everything almost everything walking. I, I don't take like taxis mm. or things like that. So I walk the whole day and then at, at night mm. I go dancing. And those parties, sometimes they finish like four o'clock in the morning. So I go to the party and I was like, I'm going to dance for two hours and then I go to sleep because tomorrow I, I have sightseeing to do. And then I said, like, this party is so good. So I have to stay until four <laughs> o'clock in the morning. I remember I hiked to Machu Picchu. I came back to Cusco and there was such a great party. And I was so tired after hiking because I didn't take the train or anything to Machu Picchu. I walked all the way there and all the way back and I went to the party. And I was like, how can you do that? That's unbelievable. And last December, I went to Colombia. I spent like two months in Colombia because I went to three different carnivals there. And I managed to dance in one of these carnivals. So it was Feria de Cali, which is very famous for salsa dancing. And mm. I went there with some salsa friends from different countries. And we all were visiting the city during the day and dancing at night. And it's sometimes a big sacrifice because you are really, really tired, but you love dancing so much and traveling so much that you cannot stop. So I was dancing every single night, eight days long in Cali. Oh, wow. And, and are these, you mentioned salsa connections, are these parties that you're knowing about in advance, you're making local connections, how are you finding them? Yeah, I try to, to contact people and ask people. So the salsa community nowadays is very, very big. Uh, so you, you can have friends everywhere in the world, in the mo most remote place you can imagine they have salsa people there. So I ask my friends every time I travel, do you know anybody there? So I get one contact and from this, you get another one. Because, you know, when you travel, you can go to, the, they have Latin parties in a lot of countries. So you can go to any Latin party. But where you want to dance real salsa, then you have to find the real place. It's not like any place. Mm. And sometimes they just organize a party from today until tomorrow. So I got the contacts and then they tell me, okay, tomorrow we are partying in this place. So you just show up and show up and, and dance with them. So it yeah. sounds like safety is not not such an issue because this is established parties that you have connections to. Yes, yes, at all. it's not an issue at all. <laughs> do, do you ever go uh, clubbing on in a town? I'm just I'm not a clubber, so I wouldn't know what advice to give people if they want to go to a destination and go clubbing. How do they pick a place? How do they take care of safety? Well, I, I mean, you can Google the place, of course, but I would prefer to ask the locals. Like if I stay in a hostel and I don't know anybody in this uh, city, I will ask the local, where do you recommend me to go? Which kind of club? What time can I go? How I go back to my to my place? What kind of taxis I can take? Um, yeah, but I I mean, I, I went clubbing in almost all the countries I've been to. And mm. I went clubbing in Burundi. <laughs> I was yeah. really, really good too. A very good party. And I went salsa dancing in South Sudan, where they had like a curfew and they told me you cannot go out at night. But the people knew that I was there. And, you know, people are very happy when you go to these countries that nobody wants to go. They are very happy mm -hmm. to know that it's a salsa dancer in our country. So they <laughs> kind of created a party on a Sunday there. And they were like, OK, let's do it from five until eight that you can return home before it's too dark. 
So they okay. did this party. I was dancing there. Then they called me like on a stage and I had to show everybody how to dance salsa. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> and that's so funny because after that that was on a sunday and i was i spent like a whole week in south sudan but i was leaving the day after this party i think or two days after and after this party i got a lot of people asking me mostly girls oh can you do like a private class with me to show me some moves and I was, oh i'm leaving i have no time so mm. they they have been writing me like we want to pay your flight to come back to south sudan to teach us some salsa <laughs> and i was like I really want to go, but I'm now in this trip, like, I don't know, in South America. So I, I have no time now, but I will go one day. <laughs> yeah, and that's incredible. I mean, the news we hear of South Sudan is almost entirely negative. And yet you're, you're, you're having these, these young women <laughs> writing you, <laughs> please come and, 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 and teach us your moves. Yeah. And that's a uh, wonderful connections you've made. I got a lot of help. Also a girl, she picked me up at the airport, so I had no issue at all in the whole, I mm. took probably like 400 pictures. And I, every time I read from South Sudan, people say like, you cannot take pictures, you cannot do that. I, I feel like very free. So I took pictures everywhere. Of course, I always asked for permission before, or I had a local with me asking for permission. They didn't have any guide, so only friends yeah. there. And this girl picked me up at the airport. I remember when I entered because they told me, don't bring so much money because they can confiscate your money. Don't do this, don't do that. And I was a little scared. So I covered myself and trying to dress to look a little bit African. And I remember I entered the airport and they were asking something in the local language to the people. And I saw like two girls in front of me, they asked him something that they did like this. And they asked him something that they did like this. And the next girl, they're saying this, this. I don't know what they asked them, but when they asked me, I just did the same. <laughs> and they were like, okay, you can continue. No idea. <laughs> and then they, the girl was waiting for me after this. <laughs> so it didn't shake my luggage or anything. <laughs> oh, fantastic. And Lily's asking, so it sounds like you both couch surf and you hitchhike. So she's wondering your best or worst experience and uh, what's the longest you've done this? So like couch surfing, how long have you stayed somewhere? Ah, okay. So couch surfing, I started like three years ago when I was in Guinea <laughs> because mm -hmm. uh, I, I got a lot of contests for the capital cities, but not from the other cities. So I was like, okay, let me try that. And I found a German guy who was married with a Guinean girl. And he, he, he told me, yeah, you can stay here in my place. So after this, I continued doing it. And I have done it everywhere, Africa, Asia, Latin America, um, everywhere I have done it. And hitchhiking also the same. I remember mm. when I posted in like solo female traveler groups in Facebook about um, tips for hitchhiking and things like that. I say, I want to hitchhike in all Latin America. And people were like, no, this is very dangerous, a lot of things happen when you're hitchhiking alone and so a lot of negative answers and i was like i don't know i'm gonna try anyway and it was very very good like uh, south america uh, mostly argentina was so good for hitchhiking mm. and the longest i have done it was um approximately like 2700 kilometers so it's like mm. I don't know, 1,800 miles, I don't know, mm -hmm. mostly, uh, something like this, because um, I hitchhiked from the north to the south until Ushuaia, and when I came back, so one of these uh, hitchhikes, I got the number from the truck driver, and he told me, oh, I, I do this every two, three weeks, so if you need a plane, you need a transport to go back to the north, I can take you. So I was hitchhiking with another girl, and then we contact this driver, and he took us from... Rio Gallegos, I don't remember, in the south, uh, near Ushuaia, in the south of Argentina, he took us until Santiago de Chile. So it was mm. like three days in his truck and two nights there <laughs> with him. <laughs> so I think that was the longest I have done. Um, and the like, good experience, I had a lot of good experience, people like uh, taking me to their place to cook food for me and they say, okay, take this food with you and then you can continue hitchhiking. Like very nice people I met all the way and I never had like a bad, bad experience, but one that was close to be a bad experience was uh, in Paraguay. I was hitchhiking from Asuncion to Encarnacion, I think. And mm -hmm. uh, I got like different uh, cars and the last one was a truck that drive again. And this uh, truck driver, we were talking and he started telling me like, weird things like oh you're so pretty and you know uh -huh. uh, i had so many women in my life and i have heard of a lot of girls hitchhiking and traveling alone and they want to have something with people while, while traveling and i was mm -hmm. like what 
this guy want from me? So then he was stopping like a lot in gas stations to make time because I think after 10 p.m. they are not allowed to drive anymore like big trucks. And he was like taking his time and it was getting darker and darker. So when he stopped in the gas station, I asked him, oh, can you take a picture of me in front of your truck? So I got the, the number, the car number, the plate on the picture. And then when I went back to the car, to the truck, I look at his travel route where he was reading what he's transporting and where he's going and his full name was there. So when he came back to the truck, I continued talking to him and I was like, oh, so I, I hear your, your last name is Portuguese. It's, it's coming from Brazil. Or, and he was like, how do you know my last name? I was like, oh, I just saw in your papers here. And then he was oh. like, oh, okay. And then I was oh. like, yeah, I, I also sent a picture of your truck to my friend. He's waiting for me in Encarnacion. And he was, which picture? And I was, yeah, the picture you took of me. That's your oh. plate number there. So my friend, <laughs> I sent him the live location and he's waiting for me there. And this guy changed the topic like in two seconds. And he was like, <laughs> yeah, actually, I, I started going to church and to pray to God to be a good man. <laughs> and I, I swear the conversation switched completely. <laughs> Unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes you have to react or to have a plan B when things like this happen. <laughs> You're incredibly resourceful. And uh, yeah, I think uh, I think Suhas was asking about memorable experiences with the hitchhiking. I think you've certainly got um. that. How about, how about the, the, the virtues of couch surfing? You you casually said around Guinea, and that's like Nigeria, another country that many travelers who see themselves as adventurous might might only stay a couple of days. It sounds like you took an extensive trip. <laughs> yes, I did. In Nigeria, I have some friends. So I had, I got contacts. I didn't know them, but I, I got these hmm. contacts. So I stayed with them all the time. So I didn't use car surfing in Nigeria, but I used but it. Also, you also mentioned, was it Guinea where you started car surfing? Yes, yes, it was there. So talk about Guinea as a country, because that's another one that a lot of travelers yeah. make a minimal visit. Yeah. Well, uh, I arrived to Conakry and I, I remember crossing this border. It, it was such a headache to um, a <laughs> long story crossing this border. And I have a friend from Rwanda that she was living there. So she was waiting for me and she was showing me the city. And then uh, she got me some friends who drove me to some other places. Then I made it to the north to uh, how it's called Futa Dijalo, I think. Uh, there is a city called Pita. I remember because it's the last name of a friend of mine. So Pita, mm -hmm. I went there and they have like very nice waterfalls in this area. I yeah. did some hiking there. I stayed with some locals um, in their villages. And I remember when I was hiking there, like every time I crossed the village, the locals came to me to give me some mangoes. I love mangoes. And mm -hmm. the mangoes were so cheap in Guinea. I think like with $1, I got like 20 mangoes. I don't remember, <laughs> but it's like so extremely cheap. And then I got it for free because every time I was hiking, they came with a big bag. Oh, take this with you. Take the. Oh, you want to come for lunch? I said, I just had lunch in the village before. Just a little bit, just a little bit. So they were trying to give me so much food and water and everything. They were so nice. And then I went to the to the house of this guy in the north, and uh, I stayed with him and his wife and three or four children. And they also had a wedding, so they invited me to the wedding. You know, in Africa, you don't need any invitation to go to the wedding, you just <laughs> go there. And they gave me like the, the dress to, to go to the wedding yeah. and everything. I, I had a great time. And then I uh, crossed the border to Guinea-Bissau, uh, I think it was. It. And uh, I, when I was there, I met uh, some Cubans, the doctors, they were working oh. there at the hospital because you know that Cubans, we, we send doctors mm -hmm. to work in a lot of countries. And I have met, I don't know, Djibouti, uh, Timor Leste, uh, East Timor, mm -hmm. so many countries I have met Cuban doctors and I met him just on the street that was in a shop buying some water and he was like, oh, you're from Cuba? Oh, you see this guy walking here? He's going to the hospital now, he's Cuban. And then I was like, oh, <laughs> then he stopped and we were talking for a while and yeah, that, that was a good trip too. <laughs> yeah, what, what do these Cuban doctors say when they, they see you? <laughs> it was like, girl, I want to go back to my country. <laughs> what the hell are you doing here? <laughs> I know. <laughs> I, I felt a little bit that way in some places where I see American aid workers or missionaries or even soldiers, and and uh, yeah, often the people put in those situations aren't are are doing it for a purpose, but not necessarily for enjoyment. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So talk talk about your your travels. Uh, how long you're staying in places? All the examples you've given are ones that 
again, it's it's more than the typical short visit that a lot of people trying to see every country in the world are are doing. So how how are you thinking about your timeline, your plan? You've been to how many countries at this point? Yeah, I have been to 134 UN countries. And yeah, well, a um, few years ago, like when I was working uh, in Germany, I used to travel only on the weekends or during my holidays. So maybe two weeks trip, something like this. So I had to be very organized with my time. And I, I went to a lot of European countries at that time, but it was just like a weekend trip, uh, like mixing salsa dancing with, with sightseeing. So in Europe, I didn't get to know uh, many countries like deeply, only capital cities. Oh, well, last year I did like a road trip in the Balkans, so I got uh, to see a little bit more. But uh, after I quit my job, uh, it was like almost five years ago, and mm. I started traveling and I didn't imagine I'm going to travel that long that much because I thought well, mm. when my money finishes, uh, I have to go back and work. But it, it worked so well that I got so, so much help from a lot of people that I decided, okay, I'm going to continue traveling like this because it's, it's a great experience. And I want to explore actually more of every country. I just, I realized like going to a country, staying two, three days, and then you start meeting people and people start telling you, oh, we have this party here. We have this place you have to visit them. And then you say, oh no, I actually have to leave. And now that this broke my hair. I was like, okay, I have to stay longer. So now mm -hmm. I don't really make a plan. So I don't know when I'm going to leave the country. I have an idea when I start my trip. I was like, okay, I'm going to stay for two, three weeks here. And I'm going to continue. But uh, sometimes I stay longer. Like I, I was traveling in Central America and I, I started in, in Belize and I wanted to make it into Colombia. I couldn't make it into Colombia because I, I had no time. <laughs> so I was traveling mm -hmm. for, I think, 11 months. And uh, I had to stop in Panama because I stayed so long in the whole in all the countries. I went to El Salvador, which is the smallest country in Central America. And I was like, okay, in two weeks, I will see the whole country because you can actually drive in one day, less than one day from the east to the west. And I was like, mm -hmm. two weeks is enough. And I ended up staying for five weeks because oh. I, I saw so much and I met so many people and people were taking their time to, to take every day. Where do you want to go tomorrow? And I was like, oh, okay, let's go to this place. Okay, I'm going to take you there. So every day I went mm -hmm. to different place and I had a different experience and I was like I don't want to leave this country never ever <laughs> and then I hear they had a salsa weekend in, in Honduras and that was the, the time when I said okay I have to leave El Salvador and cross the border <laughs> to Honduras and then in Honduras I stayed like two months oh wow <laughs> <It's> like, yeah <laughs> and you lived in uh, Mexico for a time and in Central America I'm, I'm thinking uh, is is in, in some sense, you're going to places very different than your culture and others, you're spending significant time in places that are more related to your your home culture. So talk about the, the differences for someone not as familiar in, in Central America, in the region. What are some of the differences and highlights of each of the countries? Well, uh, of course, if you don't speak the language, it could be a little bit more difficult for you to travel there. But I don't think like, language is like a big issue because I mean I traveled in West Africa for also for seven months and my French mm -hmm. is very little and I survive mm -hmm. and I managed to travel there so I don't think it's like a big issue but of course it's, it's, it's an advantage if you you can talk the language but um, I think like the best you can do is to get in touch with locals. Locals will always mm -hmm. help you to, to move around, give you the, the best information. If you want to go out at night they will tell you okay what kind of taxi you can take to go back home like even when I was in Peru in Lima and I, I went dancing a few, few nights and you know I'm a low budget traveler I don't have much money mm -hmm. so I try to do everything like very very low so I went to those parties and I went to two parties the same night because one party was a meeting from car surfers but also in a salsa place and the other mm -hmm. was like my real salsa people the real good mm -hmm. dancers so I wanted to go to both and they told me okay you have to take this taxi and this and that but I went walking and I was like I, sometimes I think I'm crazy. It was like midnight and I walked from one party to the other party like half an hour because I didn't want mm. to pay for a taxi. I was like, okay, sometimes <laughs> I'm a little bit crazy doing things I should not do. But it's, it's not like you have to, to be scared all the time that something is going to happen to you. I also in Colombia, in Medellin, I went to so many parties and I walked back. But I also asked at my hostel, can I walk back home? And he was like, yeah, here is safe. This area is safe. But you go to Colombia and you think the whole country is, is not safe. You cannot do anything. You no. cannot move around. It's not like this. So you, you ask go to the locals which area you can do this, which area. I'm not telling you to walk alone at night. Don't follow this advice. 
but yeah i, I don't think it's, it's that um dangerous like people say yeah, I was gonna say, uh, uh, Mehul in the comments says you'll definitely inspire all those you know, solo female travelers to couch surf and hitchhike. And I suppose it's uh, be careful and and maybe do, <laughs> do that as a thing. It's but it's possible, but I, it it sounds like you're doing a lot of information and I, I research. Seriously, and I had a, a lot of good experiences couch surfing yeah. and hitchhiking, and I'm still in touch with a lot of those people. It's, it's a big community of car surfing and they sometimes they cannot host you but they can take you around for free they say like oh i have nothing to do this day i'm happy to show you my city and i have done it in so many countries and and hitchhiking as well like i hitchhike in a country for example in croatia and then i the guy is like oh i will give you my number because i was going to bosnia and he's like i have few free days next week if you are still in bosnia i can take you around so he gave me his number and then i call him like three four days later and he was like, okay, where, where do you want to go? So I already visited Sarajevo. Most times like, I'm going to go to another place that, you know, that is difficult for me to reach if I don't have a car. So he took me to a lot of places that I told him. He took me for like two or three days. And he, he was so nice because I remember in Croatia, I was um, kayaking in Dubrovnik and my camera fell into the water. So I couldn't use my camera anymore because I still mm. travel with, I mean, it's very small and cheap camera, but I'm still like old fashioned taking pictures with my camera, not with my phone. And people are like, how do I use this? When I ask people to take a picture of me, I was like, what is that? <laughs> so my camera was broken. And I was telling this guy that I didn't know about my camera. And I was like, oh, I cannot buy one in Croatia because it's a little bit fancy. I will wait. And so I bought a new camera in Sarajevo, a little bit cheaper. And then when this guy, picked me up like three, four days later and took me, he brought me a camera. And I was like, this guy doesn't know me. And he was like, I'm so inspired mm -hmm. about your trips. And you told me you like to take pictures with camera and I want you to take nice pictures. So please accept my camera. I could have, I already bought a camera and I really appreciate it, but just give it to your children or something like this. But seriously, people do a lot of things or people take me to their homes and, and say like, uh, I'm gonna give you some food for the rest of your hitchhiking, <laughs> things like that. Yeah, this is, it's very good. <laughs> yeah, it does. To think about this, I think about travelers as they, maybe as they, they get more into adulthood, they they stop doing some of the budget travel things that they maybe did in their 20s or teens. And the more layers of luxury you add, the more distance you put between yourself and the kind of experiences you're talking about. But, but I think it's a good way to, to socialize, to, to get in touch yeah. with locals here, yeah, because staying yeah. at their place is the best way to see how they live. You can have dinner together and talk about whatever you want to talk in, in, in about the country and hitchhiking as well. You spend two, three hours in a car with a person and you, you can ask whatever about this country. It's so great. Oh, that, that's fantastic. And uh, yeah, I was thinking my own time in, in El Salvador, my very first night there. And again, I don't speak Spanish. I was trying to get somewhere by public bus and I had no idea that when the sun sets, the buses totally stop. Um, just the, the practice and safety. And there was where they stopped. There was no, there was it was just an, it was just an intersection in the road. There was no restaurant, no hotel, mm -hmm. nothing. And uh, it was a, a a young boy, maybe thirteen, who was working as the ticket seller on the bus. And he just pointed, and he took me to a little room he was renting, just a small room with a hammock. And he slept on the floor. He gave me the hammock, and oh. it was until four in the morning. And then uh, um, the chicken started, and he had to get back to work. And he just said, "Vamanos," and, and, uh, <laughs> and got me on another bus. And uh, yeah, these kind of experiences are. I've, I've had so few, it seems, compared to, to hearing your incredible stories. Yeah. Also uh, in, El, in El Salvador, it was Eastern time, and I didn't know the buses do, they don't drive on Easter day. So I had to hitchhike there, too, to go to the places I wanted to visit. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. So Furkan is asking, uh, did you ever get stranded while hitchhiking because you couldn't get a ride? And it, it's, it's, from what I know of your stories, you're usually helping other people that are stranded get rides. <laughs> exactly. So you know, no, actually, yeah, as, as a female, it's actually, it's very easy to hitchhike. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, I, I don't have to wait that long. I even remember I was hitchhiking from Buenos Aires to Mar del Plata, which is like 400 kilometers. But a friend of mine, he drove me until one intersection and he I had to start hitchhiking from there. And he was so scared. And he was like, oh my God, girl, how are you going to do that? And I was like, don't worry, I will do it. And he was like, please, when you, I'm going to leave you there. And when you 
get the next car, just text me and tell me where that you, you left the, the intersection and you are fine. I said, yeah, don't worry, I will do it. So he drove me there. As soon as we arrived there, he was still opening the car to get my back out of the car. And I was in the road and I did this and the car stopped. And he was like, uh, do you want me to put the bag in the other car? I was like, yes, he's going to drive me. <laughs> How do you do that? I said, like, I don't know. You just stop here. I don't know. But yeah, sometimes I, I was hitchhiking. I'm, I arrived to a place and I see a guy there and I'm like, how long have you been waiting here? And he's like, well, one hour and nobody stopped so far. And I was like, oh my God, maybe this is a difficult part, place to hitchhike here. What is going to happen? I don't know. And then five minutes later, a car is stopping for me. And then I feel so bad. And I asked the guy, do you think we can take this guy here? He has been waiting for so long. And he's like, okay, take it. <laughs> take it with us. I was so happy that I helped him. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> Uh, so Natalia is asking, where are you based? And uh, so I think we can have a broader discussion. You're from Cuba. You've lived in Scotland, Mexico, Germany. And you're right now, as we speak, you are with family in uh, Miami, Florida. So exactly. talk about uh, any of those. Well, <laughs> the thing is uh, that I, I rented out my apartment in Germany um, because I, I went for this, I don't know how long trip. I started when I quit my job almost five years ago. Uh, at the beginning, I rented only for six months and then I realized I'm going to continue travel. So I rented again. And now it's like, I don't know for how long. So I had no place to go back uh, when this mm -hmm. happened uh, with, with coronavirus. Uh, I was in Guyana, which was my last country. And then I hear that they are going to close the borders. Uh, like you cannot enter the United States either. And I was like, OK, where do I want to stay for so long? Because we don't know how long it's going to take. I was like, I'm going to go back to Miami because my whole family lives here. I'm alone in Germany. and I have no place to go back there. And yeah, so I, I came to, to Miami to stay here with my family, which is, I mean, like Germany is my second home because I have been living there for 18 years. But of course, mm -hmm. I feel closer to Miami than to Germany. The culture is completely different. And Miami is full of Cubans, like one third of the population here are Cubans. And uh, wherever you go, you speak Spanish. You don't really need English here. <laughs> and mm -hmm. yeah, I, I feel like home here with my mom. I'm celebrating Mother's Day last Sunday and with, with my whole family here. That's fantastic. And I, I spent nine months working in, in Miami. And I, I was thinking in terms of as as travel might regionally open up a little bit, uh, those American travelers that maybe it won't be possible or won't go overseas, going to South Florida and Miami would be a, a, a tremendous cultural experience for those that, that haven't had it. But then I'm going to leave and go to the national parks better if everybody's coming here. <laughs> well, I, I, I was just uh, looking at the Everything Everywhere Facebook group today and uh, uh, Gary Arndt, who runs that, was saying he's thinking of going on a photography tour in the fall to national parks and he said you know we'll, we'll have it to ourselves and one of the replies was everybody i know has said they're going to go to the national parks because they're going to have it to themselves this fall. oh my god <laughs> this may be we the have one a group picture there. <laughs> yeah <laughs> talk about that living in germany though you said uh, 18 years that, that that's a long stretch uh what were you doing there and and, and why germany yeah so i I moved from Cuba to, to Mexico. Well, actually, from Cuba, I went to Scotland. I stayed there for six months waiting for my visa to go to Mexico because the, the reason was to, to join my father. I didn't see my father for seven years when he left Cuba. And we, I saw him again in 1999. Uh, yeah. So I stayed for six months in Scotland waiting for this visa. Uh, then I moved to Mexico. I was living for three years in Mexico, studying at the university and doing a lot with salsa because the salsa was not that big at that time in Mexico. So I was working with a radio station to, to promote salsa. And then I met a, a German guy and I moved to Germany because of him. So it was a love story. Mm -hmm. And he was also a salsa dancer. We were performing together at that time, but I didn't like performing and teaching. I was so shy at that time. <laughs> Yeah, so we, we moved to Germany, then I, I studied in Germany too, and I graduated there. And at the beginning, it was, of course, a shock for me because first of the language, it, I had to learn the language. But for another, I, I learned it very, very fast because I wanted to, to go to the university. So uh, just just like half year, I learned it and I passed the test to, to go to the university. Yeah. And yeah, and then we were, yeah, of course, dancing there and going to salsa festivals. 
I met a lot of Latinos there at the beginning, but I didn't want to be in the Latino community because otherwise I wouldn't learn the language that fast. So I was missing my culture, but I needed a little bit of, uh, of uh, time to, to learn first the language. Uh, and the, the, the weather was, oh my God, I, I wanted to die. The first like two, three years, I don't know how many clothes I was wearing in winter. I have like two gloves. Like I, I, I was like a Muslim. You could see only my eyes, like wearing so many things. And I couldn't, like it was so cold for me, but then I, I got used to it. So slowly you can get used to everything, I think. <laughs> yeah, it was a cultural shock, but it, it was a nice, nice experience at the end. <laughs> Oh, wow, that's uh, that, that's incredible. I mean, what a what a selection of destinations you've lived in. I've I lived in in China for some years, and I can certainly say that that's so important and formative to, to anything I do in my life. Having that experience of a entirely different uh, culture and and uh, overcoming the challenges of, of working and getting things done is is much more in depth than than just yeah. visiting a Sometimes place. It- it's very different because, you know, Cubans, you know, your whole neighborhood, like everybody mm-hmm. opens the doors, play music, you go to the neighbor, you play domino, you drink rum. And in Germany, you live 10 years in the same building and you don't know who is your neighbor. So it is a completely different thing. <laughs> you, you must have caused a, a tremendous number of infectious smiles by <laughs> by greeting people that, that are, are shocked to see <laughs> such a smiling face in the morning when they come out of their apartment. Yes. <laughs> oh, that's, that's, that's wonderful. And uh, um, uh, our, our guest uh, a week or so ago, Mar Pages, uh, uh, based in Singapore, she talked about how somehow blogging and travel is the one area where it's okay to pry into people's work, how they make money, what they do. So you, you, you said you left your job five years ago? Yes, I do. And, and you're traveling now. Are you making money with the uh, the dance? Are you teaching? How are you? Well, how are you doing? I started a blog, but I haven't posted anything for probably two years. So I, I I wanted to share my experience mostly about Africa. So I wrote a lot about Africa, traveling mm-hmm. overland in West Africa, and some experiences I had there, because I realized there is not much info about it. But I don't air anything with this blog, and mm-hmm. um, with dancing a, a little bit. Yeah, of course, when I get contacts from people, so I save a lot of accommodation because they, they help me and they drive me some places to get around so I don't spend too much money in the countries I go. Mm-hmm. And sometimes they ask me for teaching. Like, uh, I, I'm not a professional dancer, really, because I didn't go to any school to, to learn how to dance like a lot of people did in Cuba. So I learned everything by myself on the streets dancing. But I have a, a very good level in salsa. And uh, when I was traveling in Africa, they asked me to, to teach in Kenya was the first place mm-hmm. I teach there. And I was so shy and I was like, oh my God, I, I don't know if I want to do this. And they were like, listen, there is nobody who comes here to Africa to teach us. Like all the professional dancers, they go and teach in Europe or in the States. So we need you here. And I was like, okay, I'm going to try it. So I mm. did it and I earned some money and then they were so fascinated and they were like, we want you to come back next year. So oh. they pay my flight twice after this. I've been three times to Kenya. Mm. The first time I went by myself mm. and the other two times they pay my flight, their accommodation, everything they took me for sightseeing and everywhere and they pay me for the classes. So after this, I was like, okay, if you're going to pay my flight to Kenya, you want me to teach for how long? One week, then book my flight for two months and I'm going to mm. stay there all the time traveling around. So I went there, I did my class, I earned some money and then I crossed all the borders, mm. Uganda, uh, Rwanda, Burundi, uh, Democratic Republic mm. of Congo, so all of these, and then I went back to take my flight from Kenya. So that's a, a way I, I can save on, on flights. And um, and the other thing I do, I go back to Germany once a year. So I work in Oktoberfest. Uh, I work like three weeks uh, uh, there, and then I earn. I kind of say it's a lot of money for traveling, but I try to to organize my money that I can spend it in 11 months. So I work for three weeks, mm-hmm. stay one month in Germany, and I travel 11 months. Oh, wow. fantastic. And uh, Mehul is asking, do you ever travel in winter to the cold or snowy, snowy places in the Northern Hemisphere? Uh, I try, uh, when it's winter, I try to go to a place when it's, it's uh, summer. <laughs> like when it was winter <laughs> in Germany, like one of my first trips was to Australia, New Zealand. February, March, when it was very cold in Germany. And the year okay. after, I went to Brazil, which is very, is summer, February, March. That's where, where I got to dance at the carnival. 
and uh, it was winter in Germany. So I try to avoid winter because I don't like it. I'm, I'm from the Caribbean. But oh, yeah, man. like when I go hiking, for example, uh, I, I did in Bolivia, uh, Huayna Potosí. This is like 6,088 meters. Uh, I don't know, like 20,000 feet. Uh, I don't know. Um, I did that and, and it was so cold I, like three days hiking so much as snow mm -hmm. like it wasn't until my knees and I, you have to use these crampons in the in the shoes I don't know how you call it and, and to go until the summit I, I thought I'm not gonna make it and it was very very cold but it was a good experience so <laughs> sometimes I do but it's not my favorite thing <laughs> <laughs> and an underrated country in, in Africa that you've actually volunteered in Malawi talk about Malawi yeah, yeah, that was when I quit my job. Uh, I was like, I want to do something uh, different. So I was looking for information where I can volunteer in Africa. I wanted to work with, with children. And I didn't want to volunteer in, in countries that a little bit more developed, like uh, South Africa, Ghana, Nigeria, things like that. I was like, okay, I want an underrated country and, and to do something productive there. So I couldn't find info about Malawi, and that's why I wrote also in my blog about uh, volunteering in Malawi, because I, for myself, it was very difficult to find information about it. So I found um, an agency in South Africa that uh, mm -hmm. can, could send me to Malawi to volunteer there. So I did this through the agency. And when you volunteer there, you have to pay some money that they can host you there and cook food for you. And they you kind of donate money for the school that they can build something there or whatever. So I went to Malawi. And then I realized that all the money I paid to the South African agency, they got almost nothing in Malawi. It was a bit of, little money. And I was feeling so bad. And I was like, okay, apart from volunteer here from Monday to Friday, I want to help and do something else. So on the weekends, I was, of course, touring a little bit on the country. And I realized that um, many of the, the children at the school, they haven't been to the beach, never, ever, because they don't have the money to go there. And I was like, okay, I talked to some of the teachers and we got like, I rented the bus and we went like 20 children and three teachers uh, to, to, to Malawi Lake. Uh, you know, the Malawi Lake is one third of the, of the whole country. And it's, it's not far. I, know, I, I went swimming there and then somebody afterwards said, was that really a good idea? And I said, I don't know. And then they started sending me links of everything in the water I was swimming with. So. Well, I had to take uh, some um, pills after that What's the, the there is a parasite on the lake? Be, be like, that's yeah, that's the one. <laughs> yeah, and they told me about it when I was there. But they told me, oh, you just go to the pharmacy, you get those pills. They they will ask me how high I am, what's my weight, and they will calculate how much I have to take from those pills. <laughs> so they gave me that, and they told me after six weeks, uh, when you leave the country, then you you have to take that. So I had actually no problem with those parasites. But to be honest, I'm, I'm a hardcore because also I was drinking like like normal water, like tap water in Malawi, like nobody does. And I was mm. like, yeah, <laughs> I will do it. I will try it. And I was like, I'm not going to pay for water. I will try this water. Ah, it's okay. Then I did it. So I, I've got no problem. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I didn't do, I didn't take any of them. I didn't find out about the medicine, so I'm not so good at networking, but it's been a few years. So yeah, but but that was a nice experience with, with the children there at the beach. They were so happy. And I remember so we were taking a group picture and I was the only one wearing a bikini because of course they never go to the beach. They don't need a bikini and they don't have the money to spend in a bikini. And then you think like small things like just wearing a bikini at the beach, you know, it's, I never thought that could be an issue, you know, and I got my picture yeah. the only one wearing that. I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, Furkan is saying, uh, you're amazing. Very few people's personality can come through on a computer screen. Oh, so. thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so again, again, for two weeks, she's telling me that she can't nervous about this. She's I very know. shy. Is it <laughs> <laughs> not comfortable in English? <laughs> Yeah, I first told him, no, 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 I can't do that. And I was like, okay, let me think about it. <laughs> well, it's, it's fantastic. You're you're joining us. You can see how much people are in, enjoying it. And, I'm happy uh, about it. <laughs> um, it uh, <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, I'm hearing comments about the disease that I didn't take the medicine for. So I'll, <laughs> I'll ignore that. It's, as I said, it's been a few years, but I am sharing with everybody. Uh, take a look at the comments to this video. I'm, I'm sharing the posts on Malawi and uh, uh, it, uh, volunteering as, as well as tips. And it is, it's one of those that's underrated. Um, is that the one that I believe uh, you visited the, 
National Park for free because you were the few first cute <laughs> yeah. who had uh, been there. So because that's another way you your because, personality you know, people get so excited every time i say i'm from cuba like when i travel with some friends and we go to a place and they ask oh where are you from and my friend is like oh i'm from spain and they are like oh so nice spain and you i'm from cuba oh my god i love your country i want to go there or i have been there and they start talking about cuba and everybody loves cuba so everywhere i go <laughs> they love my country i don't know mm. and then I, I went to this national park that of course not many people go to visit there in malawi and the guy was like i have never had anybody from cuba here so you are welcome to come for free. <laughs> say, Sign in my book and write you are the first Cuban who has been here and this and that. And yeah, that sometimes I go to places and people are like, oh my God, Cuba, yeah, just come in. You don't have to pay. And I take my Cuban flag everywhere I travel. I have been doing this for the past uh, one and a half year since my mom gave me this flag. I wish I, I'd done it from the beginning. But yeah, the now I, when I go to a country, I always try to take uh, pictures with my Cuban flag. And, you know, maybe if you try with the German flag in some countries, they won't be so happy. Or the American flag, they were like, yeah, I don't know. But the Cuban flag is so welcome <laughs> everywhere. Yeah. It makes, makes people happy to see it. So uh, Brent is uh, Guten Abend. Why do you choose to live in Germany? In which country have you visited offered the most excitement to you? So I guess he's assuming Germany is not the most exciting. <laughs> well, as I say before, I moved to Germany because I had a boyfriend there. So it was because of him, <laughs> love story. <laughs> it was because of love story. Uh, but the um, country, I don't know, so many countries like like Burkina Faso was my highlight of the trip to, to West Africa. I love it. El Salvador was the highlight of uh, cent uh, Central America. Um, I don't know, Argentina was amazing. So it's difficult to say uh, one country. And, and talk about, and I'll share the link uh, of your wonderful post on it. Talk about the uh, the policeman that <laughs> ferried you and, and, and guided you and <laughs> your entourage uh, yeah. around Burkina Faso. <laughs> yeah, I, I got a lot of help in Burkina Faso. It, it was such a great, great trip. I went to areas that are very difficult to reach that you, you cannot find a, a way to go there. I, I don't know how I managed to, to go there. Um, there was a time, so I, I left my big bag in Ouagadougou in the capital city, and I want to do like a round trip with a small bag in few, like three or four uh, cities there and go back to Ouagadougou. And then there was this guy who told me, okay, I'm gonna drive you with my motorbike to the bus station. And he was all the way to the bus station. Oh, girl, I'm so scared about you. Do, how are you going to manage? Do, do you have a place to stay in the city you're going? It was uh, Bobo de la So. I was going there and he and I was like, no, I don't know where I'm going to stay. But don't worry, I will go get a place. I will, when I arrive there, I'm going to ask for, for a place to stay. And he was like, no, 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 I'm so, you cannot do that, girl. I need, to, no. Then we arrived to the bus station and he started talking to some people there and he asked the guy, uh, what did you do? And he was like, oh, I'm a policeman. And he was like, oh, okay, I need your help. So you, ha you have to help my friend here, my sister. She's going to your city and she's alone. So please take care of her and this and that. And the guy was, oh, don't worry. So she's going to sit beside me in the bus and, you know, it's going to be fine. So it was like, I don't know, six hours drive. And then we went to Bobo de la so. He bought me some food on the way, was talking to me. And then he took me to his house. His wife cooked dinner for us. He took me his motorbike to the, to the mosque there and to some places to visit. And then he asked me, where are you going next? And I was like, okay, mm -hmm. I'm going to Banfora City. So I want to visit some, to some hiking there and do some waterfalls. And he was like, oh, I have a friend who's there. Let me call him. So he called his friend. And the friend was a policeman too. So that was the second policeman. <laughs> and then uh, the, his friend, he didn't speak English at all. So we had to communicate with my little French. So the, I took the bus to the next city and his friend was waiting for me there. So he took me to his house to see, he gave me his own uh, bathroom. He slept uh, in the living room. And then yeah. he was like, I'm going to take off tomorrow. So I'm going to take you around. So he took me to the waterfall everywhere. We didn't have to pay any entrance because he arrived there with his police ID. And he was, oh yeah, no, you can go inside. So everywhere we went for free then i wanted to invite him for dinner did you, you know and he was like no you don't have to pay anything here you are my guest or at least i understood this because i don't know what he told me but he didn't allow me to pay anything and then he uh, he showed me a book 
and there was like a police uh, graduation book and there were pictures of a lot of people and he was like which city are you going next and i was like, yeah i'm going to wow wow i don't remember the name of the city and he was like okay i know a policeman there and he pointed at the book okay you are gonna meet this guy so he called the guy <laughs> And then I went to the next city and there was another policeman waiting for me there with the same story, helping me, getting me around. So I got like protected mm -hmm. to, or, or even to the red area that you are like a non-go for tourists, dangerous places. Mm -hmm. I went everywhere with policemen who helped me all the way around. <laughs> so it was so great. Mm -hmm. And I have a lot of stories from, from Burkina Faso. This is such a great trip. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And uh, Brent is uh, asking to follow up your favorite food in the West African countries and uh, religious sites in West Africa as well. Well, I, I'm not like a food freak. So I know a lot of people, they travel to, to taste uh, the food everywhere they go. So I, I normally eat on the streets, whatever is cheap. Or if I go to a restaurant, it's because somebody take me there or something like this, but I don't go to expensive places. And uh, so I, I, I remember, for example, in Burkina Faso, I ate such great food on the street for like 50 cents. And it's like I'm Caribbean, so I like all this kind of rice with beans and plantains. Whatever you put like a plantain, <laughs> I will be very, very happy. So, um, the, you know, in West Africa, they eat a lot of meat. Uh, but I'm not vegetarian. Mm -hmm. I also eat meat. But the thing is that it's very spicy. Like Nigerian food is so mm -hmm. spicy and I don't mm -hmm. like spicy food. Even I was ah. living for three years in Mexico, but I, I, I knew where I can eat that it's not spicy. And yeah, it was very, very spicy. And I remember when I arrived in Nigeria, I could still uh, speak English. But when I arrived to Benin, the first thing I asked my friend is, tell me how to say, please, not a spicy food. Then he, he kind of sent me a WhatsApp with his French accent or oh, telling me, okay, not a spicy food. So every time I went to place, I chose this, okay. Not as spicy. <laughs> he probably wrote something like no flavor. <laughs> <laughs> kind of, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, actually that, that jumping all the way over that when I did live in Miami, of course, as you said, you meet so many people that are from Cuba or uh, second or third generation. And they would always tell me I'm taking you to the best Cuban restaurant in the city and it was always a different restaurant so opinions varied but what what is your pick for the cuban restaurants in miami well there, there is a famous restaurant it's called versailles in, in little havana and i think a lot of people go there and i, I went there and the food was very very good but and um, I, I think a, a lot of places here they have they have like a change like palacio de los jugos and things like that that you can buy really really good uh, cuban food but as we have so many Cubans here, like almost everywhere you go, the food is going to taste like real Cuban food. Like I remember when I went to a Cuban restaurant in Germany and I was asking for yuca, like cassava, and they was like, we don't have here. Plantains, mm. we don't have here. These like congris, rice and beans, we don't have it. It's like, is that a Cuban restaurant here? <laughs> I was like, you don't have anything. But in Miami, it's, it's like a lot of places you go that the, the food is going to be like very good. But to be honest, most of the time I eat with my family here. So my mom is cooking and... <laughs> So, oh, you're uh, jealous. So, You'll have to show us what she's cooking. When I go with my friends, yeah, sometimes they take me, but it's not like Cuban food. So they, they take me like... Since you like couch sushi. surfing so much, can your mother host us for dinner sometime? <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, and, and, and you mentioned Germany again. Uh, Brent was asking, uh, I guess, it's, is it a club, Tresser, in Berlin? Have you been to? I think it's a music club or dance club. I have heard about it, but uh, I have been to Berlin probably... 10 times or even more mm. but they have every year in october they have a huge salsa festival that i, I was never missing until i started working in october fest that i had to miss uh, this uh, festival uh, mm -hmm. and then so mostly i went there I, just, I don't know if you know tempo drum this big building there and we host the party there is huge so there are, i don't know how many mm. thousand of people dying there at the same time they have the different rooms but i remember like the only club i went apart from salsa dancing is called actually havana and it has like four floors, so you can dance salsa in one floor, then you have house, then you have reggaeton, so different uh, styles. So this is the only time I went clubbing in Berlin. Ah, excellent. And and um, which passport or passports do you travel on? Well, I have, of course, my Cuban passport. Uh, mm -hmm. I expired many years ago, and I, I did the passport again last year because I went back to Cuba after many years. I went mm -hmm. there with my mom to celebrate Christmas. 
Uh, but I was traveling all these years with the German passport, which is very easy. And it, like I get a lot of visas very well with the German passport. But the thing is, because I, I was traveling for so long, like 11 months, and sometimes you have to apply for visas in advance, and there's a lot of logistics mm -hmm. uh, behind all this uh, preparation for the trips. I applied for a second passport. And in Germany, you are allowed to have a second passport. I think in the United mm -hmm. States, you're allowed to. Yeah. But it's mm -hmm. a little bit difficult because you, you need like a letter from your uh, the, your company where you are working. And they have to say that you need to, to travel a lot because business trips and things like that. And and I, of course, I quit my job. So I had no, no one who could give me a letter. So I had to manage and get some papers. So I kind of say I was traveling because of salsa. And I was preparing this West African trip. And I needed like invitation letters from a lot of countries to get the visa, like Nigeria, Ghana, and Sierra Leone. I think they asked me for invitation letters. And I got some friends who send me this letter, a copy of the passport and things like that. So when I put all these papers together, it really looked like I'm going to do a, a something work there. I don't know. So they were like, OK, we're going to give you a second passport. So I, I, I travel with two German passports. Fantastic. And uh, that leads into a, a question that Ezra was asking, saying it doesn't want to get too political. Uh, but is it harder to travel anywhere or any challenges that people perceive you as being from a communist country? Not at all. Not at all. I think the only place I, I didn't have a problem at all because people were very, very nice to me. But the only place where I saw something written on the street against my country was in Venezuela. So mm. I, I saw some things like we want the Cubans out of this country and things mm. like that. But to me, never. I never had a problem for, for being Cuban. The, the opposite, like people love me and no. Uh, yeah. I, I think I think there's no choice but to love you as a person, but uh, even <laughs> as a country, it's uh, Thank you. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have guessed, but I'm not in, in, in your shoes to address. It seems like uh, of, of soft power brands, Cuba has a very strong soft power brand. The doctors you mentioned and cultural influences and that. Even that, to some that. countries, I was also able to travel because for example, Angola, now you have e-visa to go to Angola. But when I went sure, to Angola, yeah. it was so difficult to get that visa. And because my cousin was working there, she helped me with all the papers to go there. And also I couldn't stay at her place because Angola is also very expensive. So I, I, I didn't spend so much money because I stayed with her and her friends there, uh, Angolan friends, they took me around as well. So, so I had another cousin working in, in Guatemala. And so I, I went there as well. So Cubans were everywhere. <laughs> Yeah, I never thought about the, the diaspora so much. I, because I, I lived in China, I pay attention to the Chinese diaspora on the world, the Indian. I didn't think uh, I'll, I'll keep an eye out for the, the Cuban diaspora the as Cuban well. Cuban doctors are everywhere. <laughs> yeah, well, that is, is fantastic and, and a great service to the world. You, you mentioned that little negative sign you saw in Venezuela, but Venezuela, I think, is one that you loved. It's it's my my favorite. Uh, travel experience I've had in South America was was going to Venezuela about a decade ago, Angel Falls. Uh, you've been many places I haven't, like Margarita Island. Talk about uh, Venezuela. Yes, I, I spent 12 days in Venezuela with another EPS traveler, uh, Juan Manuel Mercader. He's from Argentina. So he had some friends in Venezuela, and those friends, they welcomed us. Uh, so we stayed a few days in Caracas. Then we went to Valencia, and the girl who lives in Valencia, she took us on a road trip to Coro, to the uh, west of the country. And um, then we went to Margarita Island. We didn't know where we were going to go until we arrived to, to Venezuela. We didn't have like a real plan, an idea we had, but we didn't know. And then we decided, OK, uh, let's try to go to Margarita Island. And that was a headache to get the uh, flight tickets, because um, if you pay uh, in dollars or like um, online or with a credit card or things like that, they are going to charge you so much because of the exchange rate, the official exchange rate. Mm -hmm. And if you pay in cash or with the local currency, it costs us, we, we paid like $25 for this flight. I mean, it's a half an hour flight, but it, it was very cheap. Mm -hmm. Uh, we were okay. We had to, to book that one for $25 and not the expensive one. But then you had to get all the Bolivars together. Like $1 is 78,000 Bolivars. It's a lot of money. And a, a normal person is allowed to withdraw from the ATM only 1,000 Bolivars per day. So it's like $1 something. So we got to get a lot of people together to put all this money and we gave them the money and it was a complicated thing. And then somebody booked those uh, flight tickets for us. Uh, mm -hmm. And then I got a contact from a solo female traveler that she, she has like a, a hotel there. 
uh, a posada, or the guest house, and then uh, she told us we, we can stay there. So it was very nice. It was like two minutes walk from the beach. Then we were at the beach. We were almost alone there mm -hmm. because nobody was there. And of course, everybody's talking about the bad situation. Like we had so many tourists a few years ago, and now nobody's coming here. And um, yeah, we were almost alone. And we toured a little bit in the island, visited some other places there, like castles, old churches. and. Yeah, it was it was a very nice experience. Venezuela people were so friendly. We went party there too. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was very good. Wonderful. It's interesting. Romaine in the comments uh, from Jamaica says uh, uh, in Central Asia just said uh, Jamaica is near Cuba to, to tell them because <laughs> everybody in Central America knows Central Asia. Sorry, knows about uh, knows about Cuba. I, I would think Jamaica has got a, a very <laughs> a very strong, I mean, Usain Bolt, and I, I guess maybe that would be the other way, is to say Usain Bolt or Bob Marley, but uh, yeah, you've got some uh, incredible reference points there that uh, in, the, in the region as well. That's uh, uh, incredible. So I, everybody's intoxicated by your smile. So I, oh, I, 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 did, I did say a few interviews ago that we want to get you on here to do some Spanish language interviews. Uh, okay. <laughs> You have a standing in a invitation when you want to do that. Okay, and then, are you going to interview me in Spanish? No, no, no. I said you will interview people. Oh, okay. I will. <laughs> yes. You and Mar, for sure, we want to have you guys do a talk. Uh, Mar speaks might... even faster than me. I know. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say you I can speak for I was trying not to be relaxed, you know, because the last time I did a podcast with, with Rick, uh, from global uh, global global gas i was talking so fast when i listened to myself later i was like oh my god people are not gonna understand what i was talking about <laughs> well you asked me to speak slowly today i, I, I clearly didn't need to but <laughs> <laughs> for for all, all all of your concern it's there is no reason to be concerned an incredible time meeting you and uh, hearing about your life everybody in the group is <laughs> is charmed and ready to couch surf, ready to hitchhike and ready to hear more from you. And I'm happy share. about it because, you know, every time I see the post in the group, I realize that the, the, the travelers here in the group, are, the way of travel is very different to, to the way I travel because I don't have that, that money to do what you guys are doing. So I try to survive on my own way. And for example, every time I see posts about South Sudan, people going to the Mundari, uh, ethnic group there and i see how much people are paying for that and i'm like oh my god with this money i can travel for three months just like mm. i cannot pay this money but i went to south sudan and i went to the tribe i went to the mondari tribe and i didn't have to pay that much money it was like very very cheap and i was like okay i think i can continue doing my way <laughs> <laughs> well mar is watching now that's all the emojis you're seeing she's in for the interview so oh. we've, 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 we've got to make it happen so. oh thank you mar <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Denai, for joining us tonight, and we hope to see a lot more of you on EPS. Thank you very much, Stefan. Thank you, everybody.